Our faculty and planning committee and staff have nothing to disclose for today's webinar. And here's our CME information. Just a few reminders before we begin. An evaluation will be sent after today's webinar. We ask that you please complete this evaluation to help us guide our future programs. Those seeking CME must complete the evaluation within one week. All program attendees have been muted today, but if you have questions throughout the program, please use the question box or the chat. And today's webinar will be recorded. It will be available on the ICAP website, our LMS platform, and it will be sent to you via email. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Greenblatt. Dr. Jean Greenblatt joined Lurie Children's Hospital Psychiatry Faculty in 2022 as Medical Director of the AGP Collaborative Care Program which provides integrated behavioral health services to the Lurie Advanced General Pediatrics and Primary Care Clinics. Dr. Greenblatt earned her BA in Medical Anthropology at the University of Michigan, her MD from Michigan State University College of Human Medicine, and her MPH in Epidemiology from the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Following completion of a transitional internship at Spectrum Health in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Dr. Greenblatt completed her general psychiatry residency, her child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship, and a psychiatry research fellowship at Cornell University Payne Whitney Clinic in New York City. Dr. Greenblatt was an attending psychiatrist and co-director of the Pediatric Psychopharmacology Clinic at the University of Vermont Health Network and director of a five-year statewide quality improvement project that provided education and support to the Vermont pediatric primary care physicians treating patients with ADHD. She also worked for the De Vermont Departments of Health and Mental Health from 2003 to 2017, developing and implementing behavioral health programs for the pediatric primary care physicians. In 2018, she took a position at NYU Langone Health as Director of the Pediatric Collaborative Care Service at Bellevue Hospital. And in 2019, she became Director of the Pediatric Consultation Liaison Psychiatry Program at NYU Hassenfeld Children's Hospital and Bellevue Hospital. Dr. Greenblatt has presented at numerous regional and national meetings and has co-authored journal articles and book chapters. Her interests include the development of behavioral, integrated behavioral health programs in pediatric primary care and developmental behavioral pediatrics and assessment and treatment of patients with anxiety, ADHD, and developmental disabilities, including autism spectrum disorders. We're not sure when she sleeps. Mm -hmm. Today's being recorded. And as I said, the recording and the slides will be posted on our website after the presentation. And now I'll hand it over to Dr. Greenblatt. Great. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, and it's a pleasure to be with you guys today. Um, it's been really fun for me to be at Lori Children's Hospital for almost two years now, working with the primary care attendings and the pediatric residents at Lori. And um, when I was asked to consider participating in this webinar about this sort of very general topic of adolescent mental health, um, I really wanted to narrow it down and have it be something that uh, would be timely and appropriate for primary care uh, providers to really think about like what they could do in their uh, in their clinical setting. And so I really decided that what might be most important right now for me to address is um, really reviewing adolescent depression and thinking about um, the importance of screening for depression and suicidal ideation in the primary care setting. So that's really what I'm gonna focus on today. And um, I think that the learning objectives are to understand the importance of universal screening in ambulatory pediatric offices, explain the actions that a pediatrician could take if one of these screens is possible, and to think about what the options are for mental health screening tools in use with adolescent patients. So I'm gonna cover briefly a number of topics today, but they're all interrelated. 
So we're going to talk about both depression and suicide in adolescence. I'm going to go through etiology, what we know, risk factors, the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for major depression, the importance of depression screening and um, the workflows that uh, you can consider in screening for depression, and then take a very similar approach to looking at adolescent suicide. And then lastly, I'm gonna round out the talk with talking about both the importance, the incredibly important role of primary care physicians in assessing and um, screening for suicidal ideation and what resources there are for to assist you guys in doing this. Um, so I'm gonna talk um, I know that the idea is for you to put questions into the question box, and I hope that we're going to have plenty of time for me to answer questions and address your concerns at the end of this talk. So I want to start with a very basic concept, which is the, the mission of the AAP, which is to support a developmental approach to children's mental health. And I'm sure you guys are very aware of this, but I just want to review it as our jumping off point. So primary prevention uh, occurs through promoting social and emotional health. Secondary prevention occurs through screening, identification, and assessment. And we're going to focus on that to some degree. Tertiary prevention occurs through treatment and co-management with mental health specialists. And again, that's exactly the role that I play in pediatric uh, primary care, where I integrate behavioral health care into the primary care setting while teaching and increasing the capacity of pediatricians to do this uh, themselves. And I really want to emphasize that pediatricians are uniquely positioned to identify and treat many common mental health conditions and reduce the likelihood that these conditions will progress to mental health emergencies. So we're going to sort of take that as our starting off point and focus on first depression, and then we'll shift over to suicide. So the epidemiology of adolescent depression has uh, really changed to some degree and maybe even to a great degree since the pandemic. Um, de major depression can occur in both children and adolescents. Children are really defined as um, 11 and younger and adolescents 12 and older. And prior to the pandemic in 2019, the data really indicated that the prevalence of major depression in children was about 2%. Um, and the ratio of males to females was one to one. So it was equally likely to diagnose um, symptoms in boys as in girls. However, as kids age and move into adolescence, both the prevalence and the ratio changes so that by late adolescence, the prevalence was thought to be between four to 8%, which is four times as much in some circumstances. And it was twice as likely to, it is was twice as likely to see symptoms of depression in um, females compared to males. Now, what's very, very important is that the cumulative prevalence of major depression by age 18, what that means is that if you were to look at all patients, by the time they reach 18, 20% of them have had at least one episode of major depression. So that's one out of five patients that you guys would be working with in the primary care setting, an incredibly high percentage. Now, since the pandemic, as I'm sure you guys are aware, there's been a very significant uh, epidemic of mental health issues in children and adolescents, with most of that being primarily around increases in anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, and to some extent also eating disorders. Um, the 2021 CDC Youth Risk Behavior sur uh, Survey, which looks at the general population of high school students. So these are not clinical populations. They're not medically ill patients. They're not patients with identified uh, mental health issues. They're the general population. And it's a self-report survey. Uh, and we, we all know that self-reports often can underestimate the actual prevalence, found that 42% of students reported feeling persistently sad or hopeless, 
uh, reported seriously considering attempting suicide and 10% reported that they had attempted suicide. And these obviously are average rates. They found within these categories that the rates were higher for black students and for LGBTQ plus students. Now, the diagnosis of major depressive disorder is, uh, is very clearly laid out in the DSM-5. And the clinical criteria is based on at least two weeks of persistent depressed or irritable mood. And I've highlighted the word irritable because in adults, depression, the mood that's predominant in depression in adults is typically a sad or melancholic mood. But that is not the case in children or adolescents. It's much more likely that you'll see an irritable mood. And the best way to think about an irritable mood is very reactive. So that the adolescent is easily triggered, can be triggered to be tearful, angry, sad, any variety of uh, emotions that to them might feel, feel somewhat dysregulated, that the triggers can be small, that their reaction might be out of proportion to the size of the trigger, and that it may take them significantly longer than it did in the past to recover from these triggers. And it's not unusual at all for the adults around adolescents to report that they just appear angry much of the time rather than uh, identifying them as being sad or depressed. In addition to the persistent mood, the patient also needs to exhibit four of the following symptoms. And these symptoms, most of them are what we would classify as neurovegetative symptoms, the physiologic symptoms that drive, that are driven by the, the illness of depression. So these include either daily insomnia, and that includes either difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep with early morning awakening or hypersomnia, sleeping more than typical, but at the same time, not feeling rested so that even though they might be sleeping an excessive amount, they don't feel that they wake up feeling rested. And very often over the course of the day, they become more and more tired. A second symptom, and this is a very important marker of depression is anhedonia. Anhedonia is a decreased interest or enjoyment in activities that previously were pleasurable to the patient. And paired with that, they often describe anticipatory anhedonia, which is the feeling that nothing will be fun, nothing will be pleasurable. And often getting through the day can feel very effortful with nothing to look forward to. So interestingly, a lot of recent, recent research has indicated that looking at anhedonia is also a very important marker of whether the depression has remitted adequately. Because ideally what we want is we want symptoms to have improved enough so that the patient's function returns to normal. And if anhedonia is still present, then really it's recommended now that that should be viewed as that you haven't adequately treated symptoms. So it's both a good screening marker and also a good marker of needing to um, more, uh, more in a more focused way address symptoms if you're treating. Um, so other symptoms, de depression include worthlessness or excessive guilt, fatigue, which is more a physical sense of tiredness, um, decreased concentration or increased indecisiveness above baseline. So if the child already has ADHD, you want to have an increase in their baseline symptoms. Um, you wouldn't rule that out as a possible symptom because they have ADHD. Um, decreased appetite, which might be accompanied by weight loss or overeating, which might be accompanied by weight gain. And then psychomotor retardation, where you might see a slowed down or sluggish presentation or agitation, psychomotor agitation, which might look like restlessness, fidgetiness, a sense of not being settled in their own body. And then lastly, passive or active suicidal ideation, which we're gonna talk about to much greater detail. Another symptom of mood disorder in adolescents is persistent depressive disorder. That's what it's called in the DSM-5. In previous DSMs, it was called dysthymia, if that's something that you might have remembered from the past. 
But this is basically a good way to think about this is a low level chronic depression. Um, in adults, the presence of these symptoms need to be present for two years in order to meet the diagnosis. But in adolescents, um, it is one year, so half the amount of time. And what needs to be present is either a depressed or irritable mood, like we talked about previously, by either self-report of the adolescent or observation. Uh, parents or other adults reporting like this, you know, this child or patient um, does not have the same mood that they had in the past. One of the things that can be a little tricky about this is that um, for kids or teenagers, a year is a very long time and they may not remember what their mood was like uh, previous to the change in mood. So often the adults around them can really uh, notice and be able to relay the difference that they notice. So in addition to this chronic mood that lasts for at least a year, um, there also needs to be presence while depressed of two or more of the following symptoms. And some of these are the same as in depression. Um, basically the neurovegetative symptoms related to sleep, fatigue, concentration, and appetite, but also low self-esteem and hopelessness, which are not criteria for depression, are, uh, could possibly be present. And then lastly, these symptoms should not be better accounted for by either the effects of substance use, which can often mimic these types of symptoms, or a chronic medical condition, um, which may also present with many of these symptoms, as well as the medications used to treat chronic medical conditions may add to the presentation. So that's not to say that a, a, a patient couldn't have persistent depressive disorder and substance use or persistent depressive disorder and a chronic medical condition, but you want to look at the direct effects of the medical condition, the substance use, the medication, and see if that directly impacts the presentation. So in terms of risk factors for adolescent depression, depression is the classic presentation of what in psychiatry is called the biopsychosocial model of risk. What this is, is that you need to consider the biological component, which is basically the genetic vulnerability. Um, family history is a, the best way to think about that. The psychological component, which is the individual person's psychological response to stress, which varies person to person. No one is the same in regard to that. And then the social component, which is the external stressors that the person's exhibiting. So the combination of their genetics, their individual response, and the stressors they're experiencing may significantly increase the risk of depression. Um, keep in mind that often that trigger, those clear external stressors may not be obvious, uh, but often they are. And then we also know that depression risk factors can increase the risk as well. And these include a negative cognitive style. This is basically a person who sees the world in the most negative way, sort of a pessimistic glass half empty type of person. And then other risk factors like trauma, abuse and neglect, substance abuse disorders, which interestingly the risk increases as much if the patient has a substance use disorder as when the parent of the patient has a substance use disorder. So that is a significant risk factor for the, for the adolescent. And then lastly, uh, chronic medical illness. So in terms of assessing adolescent depression, it's very important to interview the patient and the family to get the following information. And with adolescents, ideally, you want to interview the adolescent alone. Um, the reason for that is that you're gonna be asking some very sensitive information that may not be comfortable for the adolescent to reveal in front of the parent, or they may not even want their parent to know some of this information. So these include like substance use, uh, their social history, including gender identity or sexual identity, some of the relationship issues they may be having. So all of these things are best if you can uh, interview the uh, 
adolescent alone. Now, if the adolescent does not want to be interviewed alone and they're willing to talk openly in front of their parent, you know, obviously don't force them to, to be uh, alone. But if possible, try to do that. So what you're going to look at are their current symptoms, including the neurovegetative symptoms. You're going to be looking at suicidal thoughts and behavior and non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. I mean, that's often called self-harm. But what's important to know about non-suicidal self-injurious behavior is that the individual can be very clear about the fact that they did not harm themselves with an intent to kill themselves. Uh, usually it's for very uh, different reasons, which um, they can often clearly describe to you. The most, the two most common reasons are that um, they want to distract themselves from emotional pain by experiencing physical pain, or that they feel emotionally numbed and they want to feel something, even if it's a physical pain. But usually they can be very clear that it's not driven by an intent to kill themselves. Suicidality, and again, we're gonna talk about this in more detail. Again, you're going to want to assess passive versus active suicidal ideation, the thought of wishing that maybe we're dead, which is passive suicidal ideation. That's very different from having the thought that you want to be dead and that you want to, to kill yourself in order for that to happen, which would be active suicidal ideation. In order to get at function, you're gonna to wanna to know about academic history and social history um, and how they're doing in their community and in their family. That you're going to want information on medical history, including current medications and on substance use. So in terms of suicidal ideation and non-suicidal self-injury, we talked a little bit about the difference between the two of them. Both of these types of behaviors commonly occur with mood, anxiety disorders, substance use, and trauma-related disorders. It's very important to know that in 2020, suicide was the second leading cause of death in 10 to 24-year-olds. This only was lower than the risk of accidents. And so potentially this is something that could be screened for and interventions could be made that may really lower that possibility. Um, in regard to non-suicidal self-injurious behavior, clinical studies indicate that about 60% of adolescents surveyed indicate that they have had at least one episode of self-harm that was not driven by suicidal thinking. And it's important to know that it can occur in the absence of like any psychiatric disorder. So people might not meet the criteria for anxiety or depression or trauma, but still might engage in non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. Uh, this tends to peak at around 15 to 16 years old. So older adolescents is the peak of this behavior. And then of the adolescents that reported that they engaged in, le in at least one episode of self-harm, 50% of them uh, reported ongoing self-harm. So again, the way to think about it is 50% do it once and then that's it. It doesn't either meet whatever they were hoping to get out of that uh, strategy, which is, you know, essentially you can think of it as a maladaptive coping strategy, but 50% go on to use it more than once. In regard to comorbidities of depression, 50% of youth with major depression have at least one comorbid psychiatric diagnosis. The two most common are anxiety and ADHD, and research shows that both of those disorders tend to precede depression. And depression frequently occurs with chronic medical illnesses, including um, disorders that you guys all work with regularly, asthma, diabetes, sickle cell disease, inflammatory bowel disease, epilepsy, chronic migraine, and chronic pain syndromes. The prognosis for adolescent major depression um, is that a typical episode of major depression can last anywhere from one month to over a year. The average length of time of untreated major depression is nine months. 
And that's really important to know because that can help you in your psychoeducation about treatment and your anticipatory guidance for patients because the current recommendations are that if you were to treat depression using medication, the recommendations are that once the patient has had remission of symptoms to the point where their function has returned to baseline or very close to baseline, that at that point, you would continue for at least nine more months. And actually the recommendation is more like nine to 12 months from remission of symptoms. The reason for that is that antidepressant medicines do not cure depression. They basically modify the symptoms of depression. So basically underneath the modification of the symptoms, the depression may still be ongoing. And for that length of time, it's very likely that the depression will have resolved by the time you start to taper the medication. So that's the rationale for that and why it's so important to explain that to patients because uh, it's not uncommon for patients once they start to feel better to feel like they don't need the medicine anymore and then to stop it. And obviously their risk of reemergence of symptoms would be high. So again, to understand that is really important. Also the recurrence rate of major depression in adolescence is 70% within five years. And this, re this recurrence may persist into adulthood. Untreated depression we know is associated with increased risk of poor school function, school dropout and unemployment, substance use disorders, poor social, emotional and cognitive functioning and suicidal thoughts, attempts and completed suicide. So it's very, very important to screen for depression and to possibly make interventions to treat it if that's indicated. So let's shift over to thinking about adolescent depression screening. We've reviewed how important um, it, adolescent depression is as an illness. It is a serious illness with both acute and chronic morbidity and mortality. And studies show that only 50% of adolescents with depression are diagnosed before they reach adulthood. In the pediatric primary care setting, as many as two thirds of adolescents with depression are identified by their PCPs and fail, and they will fail to receive care because they're not identified. Due to barriers in mental health workforce and services, only a small percentage of depressed adolescents can access treatment from mental health professionals. So, so for that reason, the primary care setting has become essentially a de facto mental health clinic for adolescents. Although most primary care doctors feel inadequately trained, supported, or reimbursed for the management of depression. So based on this, guidelines have been developed by the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry for adolescent depression. But these guidelines were developed for a specialty setting, a mental health setting. And it's not simple to transfer the clinical guidelines from the mental health setting to the primary care setting. So due to the shortage of mental health clinicians and the significant barriers that exist to access child and adolescent mental health services, there, it is well documented that PCPs need to know how to learn to manage adolescent depression. And based on this, some expert consensus guidelines were developed to guide pediatricians' management of adolescent depression. These guidelines can be tailored to individual practices and there are free toolkits that can be downloaded. Uh, this is called the GLAD um, PC. And I have the, the link right here. GLAD PC stands for Guidelines for Adolescent Depression in Primary Care. And th basically these were developed to promote and support evidence-based identification, which you'll do through screening, and treatment of depression in the pediatric primary care setting. Following the publication of GLAD-PC, the United States Preventative Services Task Force endorsed universal depression screening in adolescents starting at age 12. And these recommendations were based on the evidence that validated screening tools are effective in identifying adolescent depression in primary care that untreated adolescent depression is highly prevalent and can be persistent and really affect function of adolescents, that adolescents with depression 
can have significant issues that continue into adulthood and that there are treatments available that effectively treat depression. So the guidelines were based on that. There are a number of recommendations based on this. The first have to do with screening. So again, adolescent patients ages 12 and older should be screened at least annually for depression with a formal self-report screening tool. Usually this is done at a well child visit. Recommendation two, patients with previous history of depression, family history of depression, other psychiatric disorders that might increase their risk of depression, substance use, trauma, ACEs, frequent somatic complaints or previous high scores on depression screens should be identified and systematically monitored over time for the development of depression by using a, depre a formal depression self-reported screening tool. So what this means is that the frequency um, should be probably more than at yearly well-child visits for kids that fall into these categories. In terms of identification and surveillance after screening, the recommendations are that PCP should evaluate for depression using a, the DSM-5 criteria when they score positive on a formal screening tool. And even if they don't screen positive on a, on a formal screening tool, if they're presenting to their visit with emotional problems as their chief complaint. And then the, uh, the last one is even if the patient scores negative by self-report on the screening tool, if you as the, as the doctor are highly suspecting depression, you should evaluate clinically anyway. Because as I'm sure you guys are well aware, many people under-report what they're actually experiencing. And then recommendation two, the clinical assessment for depression. Some of this we went over already, should include direct interviews with patients and families, try to interview the adolescent alone. We reviewed that already and include assessment of functional impairment and comorbidities. We also talked about that. The typical screening tool that's used in primary care is the PHQ-9. And you guys may be very um, familiar with this if you use it already. The scoring on that is that uh, you get a score of zero if, um, not, if the symptom doesn't happen at all, a score of one if it happens several days a month, um, a score of two if it happens half the days, and a score of three if it happens nearly every day. A score of 10 or above is considered a positive screen. And the, the thing that's very important to keep in mind is that this screen is a symptom screen. It is not a diagnostic tool. This PHQ-9 does not make a diagnosis of depression. It gives you a sense of the burden of symptoms. So again, a score of 10 or higher is considered moderate to severe and the breakdown of like where that lies in terms of the scoring is there. Um, a score of zero to four would be no symptoms. A score of five to nine would be minor symptoms. But again, this is not equated with a diagnosis of depression. Your diagnosis of depression is gonna be based on pairing the symptom severity with the functional impairment of the child. All psychiatric diagnoses are the core feature is that the symptoms significantly interfere with function. So you always, always, always need to look at function. So you can use the PHQ-9 to get a sense of symptom burden. Mild depression would be considered mild to moderate symptoms plus no significant effect on function. Moderate depression would be considered moderate to high symptom burden with some impairment in either social, psychological, or academic function. And then severe depression would be a high symptom burden with significant impairment in all of the areas of function. I'm gonna go through uh, an example of a systematic depression screening workflow. This is just an example. Again, every practice can modify to their own setting. So step one would be arrival. And uh, at that point, the patient is checked in and roomed. The MA obtains vital signs and a review of systems. Why is the patient here? What are their main symptoms? 
Step two is the depression screening. During the rooming, a depression screen can be administered to patients 12 and above, a minimum of once a year. Again, it may be more often if there are these other risk factors. Again, the PHQ-9 is often used as it's brief, reliable, and validated for adolescents. And again, just want to reiterate the fact that ideally the parent or someone else should not be filling that out for the patient. They need to fill it out for themselves. And ideally the parent not looking over their shoulder to see what they're scoring. Step three, the scoring and interpretation of the screen is typically done by a clinician, not by the MA. A positive screen, again, that would be 10 or higher on the PHQ-9 would trigger further evaluation. So if a further evaluation is needed, the assessment is conducted to confirm the diagnosis and assess for comorbidities and safety. Safety is essentially related to suicidality. Then the step five would be the PCP discusses the findings with patient and family. A treatment plan is developed, which may include recommendations for therapy, medication, lifestyle modifications, and regular follow-up to monitor progress. And step six would be, depending on the severity of depression and the resources available, referral to a mental health specialist um, or a follow-up visit for monitoring with the PCP or both, and then all clinical findings and plans documented. And I just wanna bring up one thing. This may take a fair amount of time. So it might be that if the patient has a positive score and you end up feeling that there are no safety issues that you focus on that, the completion of the assessment could be done at another visit if you don't have time at this visit. The process of identifying and making a plan for what to do is part of the treatment and you would be engaged in doing that. So again, the urgent issue is to make sure there are no safety issues. And if there are not, then a follow-up visit could complete the assessment if you don't have adequate time. So let's, sh let's shift to su uh, suicide and suicide screening in adolescents. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among youth aged 10 to 24, and suicide rates have increased over the past 20 years. In addition, recent studies demonstrate a 92% increase in annual pediatric emergency department visits for either suicidal and suicidal ideation without any significant increase in the overall number of pediatric ED visits for psychiatry in general. So what that means is of the kids coming to EDs, the percentage that are related to suicidal thoughts or behavior has gotten significantly higher. And studies indicate that 50% of pediatric primary care providers have encountered at least one patient who attempted suicide in the last year. And more than 50% of adolescents who die by suicide had contact with their PCP in the month prior to their death. So that gives primary care pediatricians a unique opportunity to identify and make interventions. Suicide screening in primary care has the potential to identify at-risk adolescents who might not otherwise be recognized. But the implementation of suicide screening in primary care can be very challenging because of a number of systems issues. Number one, it's important and needed to develop a sustainable workflow that can provide and consistently score the screens. If, if a suicide screen is positive, that requires more time to assess the safety of the patient. And this can create stress on the scheduling system when the additional time needed is unexpected and needs to be worked into the schedule. And then lastly, if somebody has a positive screen and it's either urgent or non-urgent, but you have concerns about the patient, there may be a lack of mental health services to assist with uh, helping you with patient care. And this is particularly an issue in underserved areas. So it's very important prior to implementing suicide screening that, that you have a system in place to manage positive screens. But despite these concerns, the benefit of screening in the detection and prevention of adolescent suicide cannot be understated. It's incredibly important. So if we think about adolescent suicide screening in primary care, 
in general, suicide screening is much more common than focused suicide screening. But the depression screen may not be adequate for identifying the risk of suicide. So if we think specifically about the PHQ-9, there are questions on the PHQ-9 that touch on suicidal ideation, but they do not address a, the acuity of the suicidal thinking. They do not clarify whether the patient is having these thoughts now. And so they're really not considered adequate screens. And then in terms of providing an additional suicide screen to a depression screen, the barriers in primary care include the limited PCP time. We already alluded to that. PCPs may feel that they don't have adequate knowledge or training about suicide risk, and that can feel uh, sort of um, disempowering to them and that they don't have the skills they need. Um, it may be that individually for some PCPs, they're not comfortable with discussing suicidal ideation and behavior with patients. Although I can tell you that you can get comfortable just by practice. And then uncertainty about the clinical management of patients who screen positive. So all of these things may be stressful, anxiety provoking, but all of these issues can be addressed and supported. A very, very common tool that's very brief um, and has been um, validated in all medical settings, including primary care, is the ASK screening tool. That's the ASQ. It stands for ASK Suicide Screening Questions. And you can get this tool. It's free of charge. It comes with an entire toolkit through the NIMH. And I have the link up there at the top for you. So this is a validated four item screen that takes about 20 seconds to administer. Um, it screens for suicidal ideation and suicidal behavior in pediatric medical patients. And that's who it was developed for, for the medical setting age 10 and up. A negative response to all four of those questions is considered a negative screen. A positive response to any of the four initial questions should then lead to giving a fifth question, which looks at acuity. By acuity is, are you having active thoughts about wanting to kill yourself now? Like not just this minute, but in the recent past. Uh, again, the PHQ-9 does not do that. So if there is a positive response to any of the four questions, that is considered a positive screen. A patient who screens positive but does not have a positive fifth question are considered non-acute positive. Those kids should be evaluated further, but it is not urgent that it happen like that minute. On the other hand, if the fifth question is endorsed as positive, that the patient is having active suicidal ideation currently, that's considered an acute positive screen, and, they, and you need to assess that patient for safety now. Typically, that patient would be a candidate to go to the emergency room to be assessed and to consider whether they need clinical stabilization in an inpatient setting. So the ASQ toolkit, which I mentioned is free, also provides a guide for a brief suicide safety assessment. And this is a workflow that helps you work through how to assess safety in positive screens. This is what the questionnaire looks like. Um, in the past few weeks, have you wished you were dead? That's question one. Number two, in the past few weeks, have you felt that you and your family would be better off if you were dead? In the Number three, in the past week, have you had thoughts about killing yourself? And number four, have you ever tried to kill yourself? So again, these are um, questions. Number three could be passive suicidal ideation. Uh, without a plan, without any intent. Um, and number four, have you ever tried to kill yourself? It could be four years ago. So again, it's not getting at acuity. Then number five, if it prompts number five, are you having thoughts of killing yourself right now? So that's the acuity question. Suicide screening in the primary care setting is crucial given the current high adolescent suicide rates. And the AAP recommends including a systematic suicide assessment 
as part of routine mental health evaluations. I'm gonna give you an example. Again, this is just an example of a systematic suicide assessment workflow. So again, similar to depression, the patient is checked in, roomed, MA obtains vitals and a review of systems. You're getting a sense of why they're there. Um, number two, the, um, you provide the suicide screening. So the AP recommends validated screens, um, including the PHQ-9, which include items on SI, but a more focused tool would be the ASK, a four item screen designated for pediatric medical settings. The screen is then interpreted and scored by, by a clinician in step three, and any indication of suicidal ideation, a plan or behavior triggers further assessment. This is a situation where the assessment needs to happen now. It can't wait for another visit. If the patient screens positive, a brief suicide safety assessment is conducted immediately to clarify risk, the presence of a plan, lethality of the method, availability of means for harming yourself, when the patient is thinking of doing it and what the protective factors might be. What are the things that might help the patient not follow through with this? In step five, the PCP discusses findings with the patient and family. For non-urgent positive screens, a safety plan is developed, including removing access to lethal means, identifying trusted adults, and providing emergency contact numbers. Patients with urgent positive screens, that means then question five is positive, require referral to a mental health specialist for immediate evaluation. Again, I would recommend the emergency room. In some cases, hospitalization may be necessary. And then step six, patients with non-urgent screens may require mental health specialist referrals or follow-ups with their PCPs scheduled to monitor progress or maybe do further assessment and all clinical findings and plans are documented. So again, this is an example. Um, I have some resources available for, for you guys to support this type of work. The AAP has mental health initiatives that provide policy recommendations, resources for pediatrician training, screening tools, information to provide to family, resident curricula, and lo local chapter action kits. And you can get that at the following link at aap.org slash mental health. And then the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, again, at this link, AAP Resources for Primary Care Home, provides free mental health information for patients and families. They're called Facts for Families. They're one-page printouts, clinical guidelines for clinicians, updates and practice parameters for clinicians, and support for the integration of mental health care into the pediatric medical home. And again, all of this is free. Many states and local AAP chapters can also assist pediatricians in connecting with integrated mental health cons consultations. Many states have programs that may not be any charge for the pediatrician or the uh, patient. And so that ends my very quick review of a lot of information. Um, I'm hoping that people might have some questions. We did have one question come in already. So thank you so much, Dr. Greenblatt. Um, and I'll go ahead and read the question um, from the Q&A. Uh, it says, if an adolescent is clinically depressed, but has concurrent trauma, like a major life event, um, could be related to adjustment, et cetera, how would you approach it? Especially knowing that we cannot control some of the ACEs that they are being exposed to. So great question. Remember we talked about how trauma and external stressors are risk factors for depression. So the fact that they would be experiencing all these stressors, it may seem like sort of common sense that somebody might be depressed. But the symptoms of depression as based on the DSM-5 criteria are really clinical symptoms. So if they have those persistent changes in mood and the neurovegetative symptoms that we described, four of them at least, so effects, you know, effects on sleep, energy, concentration, uh, appetite, uh, all of those things, then they would have the symptoms of a depression. And I would view it as 
they have depression in the setting of this significant trauma, that you can't necessarily make a change about the ACEs, but you can make a difference in terms of how they feel and how resilient they might be in response to responding to those ACEs. So the so both medication and therapy should be considered. I don't know if that answers your question adequately. Thank you, I really appreciate it. I don't see any other questions yet. If anyone has a question, you can feel free to use the chat or the Q&A bubble at the bottom of the screen. And if not, we will just assume that Dr. Greenblatt checked all the boxes and answered all of your questions with her presentation. Done do you into submission, either one. So Oop, there we go. We've got another oh, another couple of questions. Um, so I think this is a clarification. So this is not like ADHD where it's a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, can you clarify what that means for me, a diagnosis of exclusion? Can you can you tell me what that means? That I'm not sure. This is it came in through the Q and A. So, um, whoever asked that, if you could clarify what you mean by a diagnosis of exclusion. Sure, and then I can yes, give them it. one second. And in the meantime, we have another question. How do you navigate when a family might not be on board with the idea of a depression diagnosis? So great, another good question. Hi, Baco, how are you? Mm -hmm. um, so um, it is a process. So the first thing is to identify what you're seeing, to give a name to it, to explain why uh, the patient may be feeling what they're feeling and why they may be responding how they're responding and to help the family understand that, to give them information on what the options for treatment are. And if they're not open to treatment, to try to get a sense of what are the concerns they have? What are the questions? What are the fears about those treatments? And then follow up closely if they're not re ready to consider any of those treatments. So to provide them with the information to let them know that, yes, this is a lot of information that you've gotten today. It might take time to think this through, but it's really important that we make sure that your child, I'm assuming this is mainly the parent that may be resistant, that, um, that we want to make sure your child is doing well. I want to follow them closely, give them a plan for if things worsen or if there are safety concerns, which would generally be like either taking them to an ED or a crisis intervention if there were safety concerns, and then make a follow-up visit for not too long, like a month, so um, so that you can see how things are improving. Um, I see what you see about needing to toughen up or they're a teen and just moody. Again, I would give them information on what's the difference between being irritable, mood, irritable or moody and having a depression. And again, those physical symptoms, those neurovegetative symptoms are the difference. You could also help um, sort of help them like look at how it's affecting the child's function. And that doesn't happen with just somebody being a moody kid. Um, that, that what you're seeing is a deterioration in their function, what they're seeing is as well. So again, think of it as a process, have close monitoring, be available to continue to answer questions. And very often um, with time, if things don't improve, they may be open to something. Um, usually I would think that therapy is more acceptable to some parents than medication. And that's a perfectly great way to start. Um, okay, so the other one. He said, um, so if it, oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so again, if I were to get back to um, like what are the sort of, I didn't get at differential diagnosis of depression, but there are things that we, we might want to think of that you might want to rule out. So some of the common things are, and again, I, I, sorry, I didn't put in a slide to address this, but um, 
hypothyroidism, mono, anemia, chronic anemia, chronic fatigue syndrome, post-concussive syndrome, a lot of these things can look like depression. So these are the things that you might want to rule out. In addition, we talked about how depression often follows um, ADHD or anxiety. If they have untreated ADHD or anxiety, and that might be really what's driving the effect on mood because things are going so poorly for them, it may be that the most important thing is to address the ADHD or to address the anxiety. And then might not be the most important thing is to address the mood. So again, it isn't so black and white, like it's depression and possibly nothing else. There are other things that can look like it. And then of course, the effects of medication, including substances. I don't know if you guys um, saw in the New York Times that the, that Singular, which I know you guys use regularly, relatively regularly, is associated with hopelessness, suicidal ideation, and despair. So there are medications that can present with um, symptoms that look very much like depression. Another really common medication, other common medications that you guys use, uh, uh, steroids, which can really cause like any mental health uh, symptom under the sun, but depression can be one of them. And then lastly, if the dose of a stimulant is too high that you're using for the treatment of ADHD, the child can have their affect or adolescent can have their affect suppressed they can be very subdued and they can lack spontaneity and that can look like depression. So again, there are things you have to sort out and rule out. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna get at some of these others. Columbia um, suicide screening is, that's a perfectly good screening tool. It's just a little longer than the ask. So that's perfectly good if you're using that. There's no like, one, you know, like, there's no like only one screening tool that's effective for suicide. Um, and then addressing self-harm behaviors and confidentiality. Are you making the distinction between like non-suicidal behaviors and suicidal? Because usually confidentiality you would break for suicidal ideation. If they're self-harming behaviors um, and they're not serious, then you like, for instance, the child scratches themselves or snaps rubber bands on their arms. I would make, I myself clinically would make a distinction between that versus cutting yourself with a razor, burning yourself, you know, things like that. So again, I might break confidentiality for self-harming behaviors that could be putting the, the patient at risk. Um, and also if you feel that those self-harming behaviors are being driven by other things you're concerned about that aren't being treated like depression, um, that might be another reason uh, to break confidentiality. And again, what you would tell the patient is, what you tell me is between us, unless I'm concerned about your safety. We have to put your safety first. That has to be the number one thing. And in order to make sure you're safe, we need to make a plan together with your parents to make sure you're safe and you're getting the help you need. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's all our questions and also all of our time for today. So we wanna let you get back to your patients. Thank you so much to everyone who attended um, and keep an eye on your inbox for that follow-up information. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye.